Hello and welcome. My name is Jessica Adelman. I am the Social Media and Communications Manager for the Ehlers Danlos Society, and I will be your moderator today. For our webinar today, we have Dr. Patrick Agnew presenting on podiatry and EDS. This webinar is part of our ongoing series, Living with EDS and HSD. A quick note about how this webinar is going to work. Attendees are muted at all times. However, you are able to type questions into the question box at any time. Dr. Agni will not be able to see or respond to any questions until the Q&A time at the end of his presentation. Please do not send your questions more than once as it will not increase the chance your question will be answered. It will only make it harder for us to sift through the questions. Dr. Patrick Agnew is a board certified foot and ankle surgeon who runs Coastal Podiatry Group in Virginia Beach, Virginia. After completing pre-medical studies at Montgomery College and Old Dominion University, Dr. Agnew attended the Temple University School of Podiatric Medicine. Dr. Agnew's memberships include the Medical and Scientific Board of the Ehlers Danlos Society, the American Podiatric Medical Association, the Virginia Podiatric Medical Association, the Hampton Roads Podiatric Medical Society, and the Association of Military Surgeons of the United States, and the Orthopedic Working Group on the International Consortium on Ehlers Danlos and Related Disorders. He is a past president of the American College of Foot and Ankle Pediatrics and also the Hampton Roads Podiatric Medical Society. Academic appointments include adjunct faculty at Temple University School of Podiatric Medicine, and he is the founder and director of the Eastern Virginia Medical School Podiatry Residency. He's a manuscript reviewer for the Journal of the Association of Military Surgeons in the United States, Military Medicine. He's also the pediatric section editor of the Journal of Foot and Ankle Surgery. Thank you so much, Dr. Agnew, for being here with us today. Well, thanks for having me. I, I'm presenting a, a presentation that I've been presenting to other foot and ankle surgeons since I've done some other webinars and spoken at the majority of the Ehlers Danlos, uh, well, formerly Ehlers Danlos National Foundation, now Ehlers Danlos Society meetings over the past 30 years. Probably a lot of people have heard a lot of the more basic stuff. Now, I know. Uh, some of our attendees may be brand new, and some of the stuff may go uh, a little bit over your head, but you'll catch up fast. In my experience, people with connective tissue diseases know a lot more about their diseases than most of the healthcare, healthcare providers do, so uh, me included. I learn a lot from my patients every time I meet a new one. So this is going to be a, a kind of scientific physician-oriented talk. Um, but we'll have questions and answers to fill in gaps, and uh, I, I bet the audience will, will just be very comfortable with it. I bring you greetings from the American College of Foot and Ankle Pediatrics. I'm on the board of directors now and past president. Uh, also from Eastern Virginia Medical School, here's our library. Uh, here's one of our main hospitals, Centero Lee Memorial Hospital, which is one of the top 40 orthopedic hospitals in the nation now, and uh, Children's Hospital, the King's Daughters in the foreground. Centera Norfolk General Hospital in the background, one of our other, both uh, also teaching facilities for our residency, and one of the top 40 heart hospitals in the United States. So if you have occasion to visit Norfolk, which a, a lot of folks do at some point, um, you'll know what it looks like. Here's a little listing of, of some of the research that we've done over the years. Uh, went to the first I'm sorry, second annual national meeting of the EDNF, I guess 28 years ago here in Chesapeake, Virginia. I had been in practice for about five minutes and I had about five patients. So I had plenty of time on my hands. And I saw on a, a actual bulletin board with a push pin and a three by five card, it said that this meeting was coming up. And I went and sat in the back of the room and listened. And the hand surgeon who was running the organization at that time, Dr. Patrick Alessino, came up to me about halfway through the meeting. He said, are you interested in this stuff, Patrick? And I said, well, I feel their feet hurt. And he said, oh yeah, it just seems like everybody's having foot problems and nobody's really doing anything about it. So um, I sat in the rest of the meeting. We examined some patients together. We actually took little punch biopsies of people's shoulders and sent them up to, uh, uh, up to Seattle, up to Dr. Biden. And uh, I guess the next day I was the world's leading authority on foot and ankle problems <laughs> and Ehlers Danlos Syndrome. Um, I went to the meeting the following year and brought with me a, a list of some questions of problems that I thought people might be experiencing. And 
what they might be doing about those problems. And they were mostly about as predicted, although there was a little surprise or two here and there. I asked, for example, about plantar fasciitis, or more accurately, plantar fasciosis. The plantar fascia, the ligament on a sole of your foot, can get strained and injured and cause pain in your heel, usually when you first get out of bed in the morning. This is maybe the most common complaint I see in adults in my practice with or without connective tissue disease. It kind of surprised me that people with connective tissue disease would have that. I figured the ligament would just stretch, but apparently also becomes painful and torn. And uh, that was a bit of a surprise. We took x-rays of a whole bunch of kids' feet a, a couple of years later at Detroit Children's. Uh, I didn't take them. The orthopedic surgeons there did. I have no idea how they got that project through the Institutional Review Board, just randomly x-raying children. But um, it, it was helpful because it demonstrated that what we might typically expect to see in a lower arched or flat foot wasn't necessarily the case. So more on that later. Footmax, the next line here, is a, uh, a computer system which we thought was going to be like the EKG of the foot. We thought we may be able to diagnose problems by having people step on this force transducer and then a computer makes a neat little graphic image of where pressure is. Well, it didn't really turn out to be that useful. We still have that data. We don't know what to do with it. But um, basically, you can do the same study at Walmart by stepping on the Dr. Scholz thing. So it's not as sophisticated as it seemed. 25 years ago. Um, after uh, several years of, of meeting a number of people with EDS and trying to get some ideas together, uh, we published a, a paper in Clinics in Podiatric Medicine and Surgery about uh, properly diagnosing foot and ankle problems, um, particularly flattening of the arch. We suggested that in order to do a good job of this, you had to take into account uh, congenital anomalies, uh, neurologic problems, musculoskeletal problems, and connective tissue disorders. And we think that was the first time in print in podiatric literature, and it, it got people's attention that, you know what, one of the reasons a patient might have a problem, it might be because of connective tissue disease. We recently published um, a poster on replacement of a ligament on the big toe to help keep your big toe straight after bunion operation, something that's extraordinarily difficult in people with connective tissue disease. We then uh, published a, a paper of bench work on, on people with tensile, or the tensile strength of the ligaments around the big toe, and then also the ligaments around the ankle. But then we did uh, a paper which is more for pain management, in which we used a thing called fluorescence angiography, where we inject a patient with a dye that fluoresces when it's excited by a laser, and it makes it makes light in the infrared spectrum. So you can use an infrared camera to look at where there is circulation on almost a microscopic level. Uh, there's certain pain syndromes that involve variation in, in circulation. So this can be a useful diagnostic study. More on that later also. Uh, at the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons in Nashville this past spring, we presented data on our experience with recreating the ligaments of the ankle to try and keep people from spraining them repeatedly. And also at the American Podiatric Medical Association in Washington, D.C. this summer, we presented data on replacement of the big toe medial ligament uh, with more experience than the previous poster. And that was an oral abstract. So uh, that's where we're at so far. I won't belabor this, but uh, you know, there certainly are a number of different collagen disorders. Uh, when we talk to other doctors, we talk about how osteogenesis imperfecta is perfect, perhaps the prototype since it affects type 1 collagen. It's commonly associated with not only bad ligaments, bad skin, but also fractures. Um, this is a patient I met early on with a very flexible big toe and did have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. So when we talk to surgeons about helping, trying to help people with connective tissue disorders, we touch on a number of points, special considerations. So for example, handling soft tissue can be challenging. In classic type and vascular type, sometimes trying to sew up a le an incision is like trying to sew wet tissue paper together. It's, it's challenging. And we'll talk about some ways of maybe doing that better in the future. 
vascular fragility can can often be a an issue and it's it's important to handle vessels well and be aware that they can tear and and break easily and might need to be repaired bone fragility may or may not be inherent to connective tissue disease alone but unfortunately a lot of people who have connective tissue disorders are forced by pain or or repetitive injury to uh, lead a relatively sedentary life and can become deconditioned and bones can become soft. This is important when you're talking about operating on someone and maybe trying to do something with their bones. You, you want to make sure the bones are, are strong enough to be expected to heal properly. Um, I mentioned those x-rays at Children's Detroit. We noticed that um, over or pronation is a normal function of the foot. The foot is supposed to pronate in order to adapt to sand or gravel. And then it's supposed to become rigid again and become a lever to propel your body forward. But if connective tissue disease is present, sometimes, uh, and, and in other circumstances, the foot may pronate beyond where it's supposed to and stay there. It's also possible for a foot that really can't pronate at all to basically sag, just to kind of droop. And that is that creates an interesting impression. You might look at it and say, well, I look at the bones on an x-ray that don't look like they're pronating, but for some reason the arch is low. Well, we call that here a sagging foot, and we think it's a common thing in connective tissue disorders. Interestingly, the Achilles tendon, biggest tendon in your body that hooks into the back of your heel, can still be tight. Even though every joint in your body might be flexible, that muscle that connects that tendon can become contracted and can become tight. Ankle instability is understandably a very common problem. Uh, other common problems like, well, hypermobility throughout the body, flat feet with or without hyperpronation or overpronation, and ankle instability are commonly seen. Some common foot problems may appear uncommonly or in, a, in an uncommon manifestation. So here's a patient who's had a bunion operation on that left foot, and unfortunately, when the surgeon tried to put the joint capsule back together, it leaked. So joint fluid leaked out and created a what looks like a tumor. It's a more or closer to a ganglionic cyst and one of an example of a number of different pseudotumors that, that can be seen in connective tissue disorder. Um, you may find hypermobility of a number of joints. Uh, here's a, a patient doing a trick that I told her never to do again after she showed this to me. Uh, we did it one more time for the camera, but this is an example of where the ligament that's supposed to hold that tendon in place is failing. Of course, you may recognize these as maneuvers in Byton's, uh, Byton's score to evaluate hypermobility. And down here is a patient who has a, a relatively common deformity of the foot called metatarsus adductus, where the metatarsals bend a bit in this direction but a very severe presentation of it uh, seen in, in people with connective tissue disorders. Other congenital problems like a true club foot, and here's another patient with metatarsus seductus, um, may be worse than they would be in someone who doesn't have connective tissue disorder. This is believed to be because in a, in a, in a uh, fetus and uh, an infant, the ligaments are usually stronger than the bones an otherwise normal person. But in, a, in an infant with uh, connective tissue disease, the ligaments may be too stretchy and not be able to protect the bones from things like the forces inside of the uterus, and the baby can be born with pretty severe deformity, or more accurately, packaging defects versus manufacturing defects. The bones, the bones might have been normal, but they got squeezed and bent out of shape because the ligaments weren't there to protect them. We tried to develop a number of principles that we thought might be helpful for people to, uh, or doctors in particular, working together with patients to pursue and trying to improve quality of life, at least at the level of the foot and ankle. So one of the things we want to try to do is, is try to put the foot and ankle in close to normal or at least functional anatomy. We want to avoid skin injury particularly for those uh, classic vascular type patients in whom skin, it, it, like if I want to make an incision, I want to make it small. I'll make it gently. Uh, we 
a lot of orthopedic surgery, a lot of foot and ankle surgery requires the use of ligaments to make things work properly. We cut them, we move them, we tie them together. None of those procedures, in my experience, seem to work very well in people with connective tissue disease. So we don't rely on ligaments that have already failed. Uh, and we try to time our intervention wisely. So sometimes, uh, certain conditions, we might want to wait until they are at their worst possible point and then intervene. Others, we might want to intervene preemptively, depending on uh, the patient's goals and objectives. And um, so just, just waiting, all, waiting till the last minute is not always the smartest move. In aligning and maintaining anatomy, we can do this in a number of different ways. We often recommend orthotic arch supports. And I'll be the first to admit that the science on orthotic arch supports is immature. Uh, there's a lot more art than science to it. And so we, uh, we try to come up with an arch support that's comfortable and tolerable and does the job. There are many, many different materials and design techniques, and there's no one right way, and there's no good scientific data to say what might be the best way. My suggestion would be that sometimes different orthotics might be useful at different times of the day. A firmer orthotic in the beginning of the day might be desirable to uh, to try to realign the bones optimally, but then later in the day, it might actually become uncomfortable and painful, and you might have to switch to a softer one. Um, same thing with shoes. A sturdier shoe might be useful for someone working in an operating room and standing up all day. A more flexible shoe might be more beneficial to someone running up and down uh, wards to try and take care of patients in a number of different rooms. Arthrodesis, or fusing joints, in my experience, has had pretty mediocre results. I've seen a lot of people who've had joints fused and have been very unhappy. Uh, my theoretical understanding of this is that if, you, if all of your joints are flexible and you fuse one joint, all the other joints are probably going to get worse. Now, there are exceptions to this. Sometimes this is something we have to do when, when we've tried other things and they haven't worked. But I always tell my, my surgery residents, uh, don't do your last operation first. You know, save, save your save plan C for when you really need it. Talotarsal joint stents we're going to talk about in detail. These are controversial. Uh, they're small implants that are inserted into a part of the foot called the sinus tarsus, the contents of which, which incidentally are called hoax tonsils. So you have sinuses and tonsils in your feet. You probably didn't know that before tonight. But we sometimes put a little device that looks about like a bullet into the sinus tarsus in order to try to stabilize the hind foot gently without actually fusing it. Ligament replacement has become exciting to us. This is where we use Dacron polyester suture materials and titanium bone anchors to try to replace ligaments. Traditional surgeries that involve transferring a tendon to make a ligament or using material from a cadaver or another animal to try and make a ligament, uh, in my experience, have not done well because over time, your body is going to replace that material with your own collagen, which isn't all that great. And so not, uh, not expected to give good lasting results. So this is an example of using suture material. Over here, you see these little buttons that we've put in there, these happen to be stainless steel, and there are strings connecting them to take these, these deformed bones and put them back where they're supposed to be. Our goal is not to make the foot prettier, it's just to make it work better. And sometimes when you have a foot like this one, it just doesn't fit in any shoe and it hurts all the time. So if we can gently put those bones in better alignment, sometimes that's a good thing to do. Advantages of this type of approach are that the suture material is very strong. We think that in and around Virginia Beach, archaeologists will find a lot of people with perfectly straight toes and steel or titanium and string in their foot who obviously went through some bizarre ritual, but their toes will still be straight 3,000 years from now. Um, these procedures can be minimally invasive. Sometimes a very small incision is all that's necessary to do this. And it may avoid the need for some types of bone surgery. If we cut your bone, if we fuse your bone, you're probably not going to be able to step on it for a period of time, which means you might have to use crutches 
and you might ruin your shoulders or your hips trying to use a knee walker. So we try to arrange, we try to design procedures that allow you to bear weight as soon as possible. This is a poster that we published on this at the uh, American Podiatric Medical Association two years ago. And you can see these little bone anchors I was referring to holding the toe straight. And this is the normal anatomy that we're trying to reproduce. This little video is from a commercial company I do not work for. I don't get any money from them. Uh, it just happens to be a pretty cute video describing a way of trying to put bones back where they're supposed to be. Oh, seems to be lagging. Uh, using suture and buttons. So here we're uh, removing one of the tendons that might be holding the toe crooked. Uh, removing a bunion that's sticking out of the side of the foot then drilling through the bones. Actually, this is not being done at the correct angle, but um, we've made improvements on this, so, so it works better. And passing suture material on a very cleverly designed wire through those holes, then toggling a little button on the big toe side of the foot, and tying the strings together to make the, the bone straight. We think it'll be that way a long time from now. So here's a patient with classic type EDS. You can look at her knees and her shins, and you can see some uh, scars that, from minor traumas that have the very typical appearance. And she has painful bunion deformities on both feet. We went on to remove the bunion. We also did, in this case, make a cut in the bone and stabilize it with a little titanium screw. We put bone buttons on both sides of those two bones and pulled them together, as you just saw in the video. We also put bone anchors here and here and tied a string together to hold the toe straight. And I can tell you, having recently examined this patient, that many years later, it's still holding up nicely. We developed a technique for kind of fine-tuning the alignment of the toe using a particular bone anchor. This one has a knob on the end of it outside of the screen, and when you turn the knob, the suture material sucks down into the anchor and spins around the spindle. The anchor expands, and it grabs hold of the bone, and you can see in this cadaver, this is the deceased person's foot, you can take that crooked big toe and line it up. Back to the talotarsal joint um, stent, uh, talk about the history of it, some goals, advantages and disadvantages briefly. So this has actually been around for a long time. Back in the 40s, they used a piece of bone, primarily in children with muscular dystrophy or cerebral palsy in order to try and build an arch. And they put this piece of bone into that hole in the side of the foot. Problem with bone grafts is over time, they had dissolved, they're replaced by native tissue. This wouldn't be expected to last. In the 70s, Dr. Sobotnik was using a plastic plug that he carved out of a block of, of, of uh, silicon plastic and inserted. And it worked pretty well, but unfortunately, silicon fell way out of popularity around that time because of a big suit about uh, silicon breast implants. Um, polymer implants were popular for a long time, particularly right when I started practice in the early 80s, but they can sometimes fray and shred, so they've fallen out of popularity a bit now. Metal implants are, are more popular currently, and so far we've had certainly several decades of experience with, or a couple of decades of experience with, with metal stents in the sinus tarsus, and they've done well. So back to the, the different materials. Um, well, I'm sorry, I skipped around there a little bit. The goals of the procedure are very critical to understand. Um, we, our primary goal should be relieving pain and improving function. Sometimes surgeons take their eye off the ball and they get, they get trying to accomplish things that they really should never have even tried. We also want to interfere with the natural progression of, a, of an overpronated foot, which often leads to bunions and hammer toes and pain throughout the foot. So, our goal should be to do those first three things and not worry about how the foot looks when we're done. This is not a cosmetic procedure. It's not intended to make the arch look right. 
it, it may be a mistake to do so. In fact, putting in too big of an implant and trying to make a prettier foot can actually make it more dysfunctional. Okay, back to materials. These are high molecular weight polyethylene pegs that uh, were drilled and plugged into the heel bone to try to try to block extraneous overpronation or flattening of the arch. And they work quite well. And I had some experience with these early on, even back when I was a resident. But uh, there is a concern about this material fraying and shredding over time and particles of it getting into the soft tissues. This is kind of a clever implant that combines that material with a metal screw inside of it. And when you turn that screw, the thing expands to fit, which is kind of cool, but same worry about the polyethylene. This is an early version or what we're now calling a first generation sinus tarsus implant of metal. And unfortunately, it's not anatomical. It's not shaped like the actual place you're putting it. And these, in our experience, cause pain. The more modern devices are shaped more like the actual um, part of that foot we're putting the implant in. And this one in the center is the one we're using most, most commonly now. That little snout, snout on it fits into a hole in the foot called the cannulus tarsus. The size of the thing matters. Um, I had occasion as a, a journal editor to look at a paper that com was trying to compare absorbable versus metal implants. And unfortunately, it failed to say that one was superior to the other. My personal feeling is using absorbable implants is a bad idea in people with connective tissue disease because although it might hold the foot straight initially, the uh, foot's probably just going to go right back where it was when the thing dissolves. This was designed for use in children, and we had hoped that lining the foot up before the bones were mature would allow the bones to mature in the right position. But if the ligaments are faulty, probably not a good idea. But one thing the paper did was they measured the size of the sinus tarsus and the cannulus tarsus using a computerized tomography. It was the first time we had the actual dimensions of that thing. And we found out it's a lot smaller than you think. So a common error with these devices is to put in too big of an implant. Again, maybe shooting for a cosmetic improvement and losing the sight of the fact that we're really just trying to make the foot work better, not necessarily look much better. Um, this is a commercially produced version of a thing we've been kind of building ourselves where a bone anchor is put into the fibula, a bone anchor is put into the talus, and the most commonly injured ligament in an ankle sprain is replaced with webbing material like a Boy Scout's belt. Um, this we've had good luck with. We actually use, as I say, different bone anchors and suture currently, but um, we do think this is a very good idea. We also replaced another ligament over here, but more on that in a minute. I was pleased to uh, meet a patient recently for a second opinion who a foot and ankle or orthopedic surgeon in another region of the country had recommended this for. And I was, yeah, that's a good idea. Because again, the traditional ankle ligament stabilizations using collagen materials, I believe are a bad idea. So our residents have started to call this kind of our blue plate special for people with connective tissue disease. Uh, uh, we've put in quite a lot of them now, probably well over 100. And we've reported on a number of follow-ups out to five years or so. But here you can see we've, we've put that stent into the sinus tarsus. We put bone anchors into the fibula. We tied those to bone anchors in the talus and the calcaneus. And we did this all through a very small incision and one other little stab incision. These are um, blemishes of some sort. Those aren't actually part of the surgery. Uh, it is an abnormally heavy scar, as this patient unfortunately has suffered. But fortunately, it's a very small one. Uh, so that's, that's about all we have to do to get into the area where we work. This reconstruction of, the, of this ligament is not anatomical. The normal calcaneal fibular ligament goes deep to some tendons that come down the side of the foot called the perineal tendons. We put it over top of the tendons. We do that deliberately, not only because it's easier, but also because those tendons have a bad habit of dislocating on people with connective tissue diseases. There's supposed to be a ligament from the fibula to the calcaneus there over the 
tendons holding them in place. And that ligament can get stretched out of shape and those tendons can dislocate just walking around and lead to a lot of pain and disability. So we're kind of trying to get a twofer out of that construct. We're trying to both keep those tendons in place and prevent people from rolling and spraining their ankle. All ligaments can fail uh, in people with connective tissue disorders. And so sometimes we, it's almost like pushing on a balloon. We'll fix one set of ligaments, another set of ligaments might start to hurt. So this is a patient who's had one of those first generation sinus tarsus stents quite a long time ago, had ligaments reproduced in the ankle and the talus. Uh, we actually cut the ankle bone and swiveled it back a little bit to try and keep the tendons in place. And we tied down those tank tendons with a bone anchor here. We then noticed that she experienced pain on the front of her ankle here that she didn't have before. What we think is that we restricted movement of this part of the foot sufficiently that this part was moving too much. So we tied those two bones together with strings and buttons. This patient had very soft bones, so unfortunately one of those buttons kind of sunk into the bone and we had to instead put a plate on her ankle and more buttons recently, which seems to have helped, at least initially. This is another patient in whom we had to tie those two leg bones together. We've only had to do this in about three or four people so far uh, out of the maybe 100 or so who've had the basic construct down here. And so far, two out of three are feeling better. And uh, we're, uh, the third one is recent enough that we're hoping that it's going to work out. Um, but that, that's another thing we've learned is that, like, like expected, if you limit movement in one joint, other joints can become symptomatic. Or maybe symptoms in those joints can be unmasked. So sometimes, like in the previous slide, Matt Damon in the Martian movie, you have to just you keep making stuff up and trying, trying to figure out how to help. This is something intriguing to me. I'm, I'm hoping somebody in the audience has had experience with this. I have not yet, but I'm, I'm looking forward to using it soon. What it is is a little plastic uh, tray with a bunch of zip ties on it, very, very small zip ties, and a collagen-based adhesive. So you basically stick it to both sides of the wound and you pull on the zip ties to pull them together. I think this might be a, a good way to try to close incisions or lacerations on people with connective tissue disorder, a particularly classic type of vascular type in whom sutures will uh, all too often just tear out. Um, something I'm looking forward to trying. On the side here is a, a fluorescence angiogram like we talked about earlier that's showing of the amount of oxygenation in different tissues. Now this is uh, showing where the, where the zips have been used and um, they're, they're decreasing but not over tightening the, uh, the tissues and not trying to squeeze them so much that you don't have enough oxygen to heal properly. So let me know if anybody's had experience with that. I do have a handful of slides about uh, pain management in general some of which may be applicable to people with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, but we only have about 23 minutes left. So I'd say uh, let's hold off on those slides. If we get through questions and answers and people still want to go through that part, we will. But I would like to open up to questions now, please. Great, yes, we do have some questions. Um, if anyone else has any more questions, please type them into the question box and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, our first question is for patients with EDS um, and CRPS or just EDS in general who have a mast cell disorder, have you ever had anyone who have a reaction to the anchor materials during surgery? Not that we know of. Um, so far, the anchor materials have been well tolerated. They are very deliberately hypoallergenic, and there are many decades of experience using these materials in a broad variety of patients, including patients with autoimmune disease and mast cell activation, which can look a lot like an autoimmune disease. Uh, now, uh, we have had uh, at least one patient with this construct that got uh, uh, sort of subclinical, not, not full-blown, but some signs and symptoms of a complex regional pain syndrome. 
and that patient's recovering, uh, but definitely had a longer than anticipated recovery. I don't think the materials had anything to do with that. We just know that a certain number of people who have trauma of any kind, including surgical trauma, may have complex regional pain syndrome. You know what, I am gonna flip down these slides real quickly to show you something about that. Um, I won't go into the whole diatribe about opiates and the big problem we've had in Virginia as well as a lot of the country. But this is a patient with a complex regional pain syndrome. You can see how withered and, and irritated the left foot looks compared to the normal right foot. Um, we use the same fluorescence angiography to try to diagnose that. There is no acid test for complex regional pain syndrome, but we think this might turn into a very valuable test. Uh, once again, we inject a dye, we excite it with a laser, and we take an infrared photograph, and we can see where there's circulation and where there isn't, as in this poster we presented on it at the American College of Foot and Ankle Surgeons two years ago. And if you look at the this picture, you'll see one foot has plenty of circulation, the other foot has not nearly enough. And that's uh, that's one of the signs of advanced complex regional pain syndrome like this patient has. This patient, by the way, that you saw the photographs of in these images, did not have Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome and uh, had a completely different problem. But um, the, usually, if, you're, if you start to have signs or symptoms of complex regional pain syndrome, your surgeon will accuse you of malingering and seeking drugs, and they'll think you're crazy. Now, I will say that the, the majority of people with complex regional pain syndrome do have some emotional overlay. But this is proof, this is a scientific study that can show that it is not in your head. Now what's in your head can exacerbate it, and it's wise to get counseling if you're going through this horrible disease. But this way you can actually measure it. You can take a picture of the two feet side by side and say, look, this foot looks different than the other foot. This is not all in my head. And that can be useful. Also, it's a way to maybe measure whether or not treatment is helping. So let's say you get a sympathetic block in your lower back. Uh, we can take a picture and see if it did help to improve circulation and start to resolve the problem. So anyhow, really long answer to a, a, a smart question. Thank you for that question. A lot of people who watch this webinar, they see that you are um, very knowledgeable with EDS, but their local doctors may not be. Um, how Do you have any recommendations for educating local doctors or getting them to take seriously the role of EDS in their pediatric problems or anything of any words of wisdom for people who may not be able to see you specifically? Well, between now and when I eventually retire, just give them my phone number and have them call me. Um, <laughs> you, they're not a lot of people, me included. I mean, with the experience I've had, which may be maybe the largest in the world, uh, I, I still feel ignorant and inexperienced. I still learn new things all the time. And I, I'll be the first to admit it. But uh, just had a talk with a doctor in California earlier today about a patient who lives in California about what might help that patient. So I've got a doctor locally there who, uh, podiatry is a fairly small profession. So I probably know foot and ankle surgeons in every state and a few foreign countries. And so if if you can get to one of those patients closer to home and have them physically examine you and talk to me on the phone, sometimes we can come up with effective treatment plans. We have had a lot of people come here for surgery from very far away, from Scandinavia. Uh, and we are well set up to do these kind of procedures locally here. We actually have a hotel within our big teaching hospital called the Guest Quarters. They took some old hospital rooms and turned them into like a probably about a third-rate hotel, but um, we can operate on a person on a Friday, have them spend Friday night in the hospital getting excellent pain management, and then move into the hotel Saturday and Sunday. Maybe let me look at their incision on Monday and go back to wherever they came from. And, and uh, that's worked very well for a lot of people from, from very far away. So there is a way to do that um, if your doctor is willing. And if your local doctor isn't willing, there's probably one close enough that you can get another opinion. Unfortunately, it is true that people with connective tissue disorders, sometimes connective tissue disorders, the very last thing a doctor thinks about. 
I travel around the country and around the world lecturing about this, and more and more people are learning about it. Heck, when I started this 30 years ago, 28 years ago, um, we thought that EDS occurred in one in 750,000 live births. That's what the textbook said. Uh, maybe, maybe 15 years ago, they were saying like one in 150,000. Now they're saying like maybe one in a thousand people might have something wrong with their collagen. And all of a sudden, more and more doctors are paying attention to hypermobility and wound healing and things like that and saying, you know what, there's maybe something special about this patient. They're not just crazy. They don't have multiple sclerosis. They don't, they, they don't have uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Or maybe they do have those and a connective tissue disease. We've certainly pe seen people that are crazy and have multiple sclerosis and have rheumatoid arthritis and have Ehlers-Danlos syndrome all in one. Uh, that's, a, that's a big challenge. But I think awareness is growing. I certainly, I've, I've taught 30 residents over the last 20 years and they're scattering around the country and hopefully spreading the word and making people think about that other dimension of the patient. A foot surgeon, we have a pretty simple job. You got skin, bones, tendons, nerves, blood vessels, muscles. That's, that's pretty much it. And there's a short group of things that can go wrong. You can break them, they can get infected, they can have tumors, uh, they can have pinched nerves. And and that used to be what I thought was about it. But as I learned more and more about Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, I realized you know, there, there's a whole other dimension there. And what I was taught by Heidi up at uh, up at South Bend, one of our uh, earlier, or one of our past professional advisors network uh, leaders was that every cell in your body is connected to the next cell by connective tissue. So if there's something wrong with your connective tissue, it can affect every organ system, every system. And in order to understand connective tissue disorders, the doctor has to know everything about everything. And I said, well, Heidi, I don't, I'm not that smart. I'm a carpenter, maybe a cabinet maker on a good day. <laughs> I can try to understand how the, the foot is uh, and ankle is affected by this. But I am, I do appreciate the fact that all of the, all the body is affected by connective tissue disorder. And so I have to understand things like POTS to the best of my ability and mast cell activation. And uh, I'm, I'm learning and I appreciate the patients teaching me. Thank you for that. For newly diagnosed young person with connective tissue disorder and extremely flat feet, do you have any advice to prevent common foot complications or any other general recommendations for preventative care? Yes, um, you need to be physically evaluated by uh, someone knowledgeable about foot and ankle anatomy, and you probably need some good arch supports. And you have to exercise. Every human being has to exercise. Now, how you exercise should be very carefully thought out. You, know, you might need to, you know, if you if you really like swimming, you might talk to your orthopedic surgeon about your shoulders first. If you want to run, you definitely better talk to a podiatrist, maybe an orthopedic surgeon about your feet, ankles, and knees, and hips. Um, but everybody's got to exercise. My favorite recommendation is aquatic exercise. Um, I live at a beach. <laughs> I think salt water cures everything with, through sweat, tears, or surfing. <laughs> I can solve all my problems. <laughs> um, but uh, getting in the water to maintain muscle tone and avoid trauma to the joints, I think is a very good idea, even if it means just walking around in the shallow end. Doesn't necessarily have to be water aerobics, certainly doesn't have to be competitive swimming, but uh, moving around in the water is beneficial for most people. If at all possible, I recommend that. So that young person, yeah, there are some things you can do and you should do. Is there anything you can recommend for ankles that roll constantly? braces or anything before you get into those more extensive surgeries? Yeah, we don't do those surgeries until these other things have been tried. And the other things that need to be tried are you have to find a gentle, intelligent, teachable physical therapist or trainer to help you go through some gentle exercises to optimize the strength of the muscles around the ankle. Also, Bracing 
could be a very good idea, particularly if you're going to have a challenge, like if you're going to be on an uneven surface or or maybe participating in a sport that, that might challenge your ankle stability a bit. But um, bracing can be great. Now, a specific brace I can't really recommend because um, you guys aren't exactly snowflakes, like not politically, but um, <laughs> like no two alike. But I will say that, that humans in general, people with connective tissue disorder, you're not a homogeneous group. There are a lot of different presentations, a lot of different foot shapes, sizes, the skin tolerance. There, there are a lot of things that go into um, bracing. And it's like just the arch supports we talked about earlier. I think there's more art than science to it. Now, there are brace companies like Bauerfine that seem to be particularly interested in trying to help people with connective tissue disorders. And I would encourage you to patronize them and try that. I don't work for them. I don't get any money for them. But I, I like seeing them in a, at the meetings. And I have seen them come up with some very clever braces. Uh, I'll tell you, sometimes you can go over to Dick's Sporting Goods and spend 35 bucks and get a perfectly good brace that will work well. But uh, bracing can certainly be beneficial. Now, most of the people we're operating on, they, well, all the people we're operating on, they tried those things and they just weren't good enough to allow them to live the lives they want to live and not sprain their ankles frequently. And by the way, every time you do twist your ankle, you can damage the cartilage inside of the joint, the surface that, that coats the bones and makes them slippery. And that damage is, with current technology, irreversible. We are doing a lot of experimentation with regenerative medicine, trying to grow or replace cartilage, but we're not really there yet. We haven't, we haven't mastered that. And so once you ding up your ankle joint, it's going to be dinged up. It's not going to work like its original equipment. So spraining your ankle over and over again, even if it doesn't seem to hurt, is a bad thing. Do you recommend kinesio taping for ankle instability? Often, yes. Um, I, I, we often try taping early on as we're meeting a patient and, and trying to figure out just how bad their situation is. Um, I think it's the most effective brace because it is perfectly contoured to your body. And they have different uh, tensile strengths and elasticities of, of different types of tape. So you can pretty much reproduce the ligament, but not everybody's skin can tolerate on it. It can tolerate it, and it may not be practical for long-term use. Sooner or later, you, you're going to irritate skin, create a dermatitis or something by being taped all the time. So it, it's, it's a useful step in the process. Will strengthening muscles prevent surgery? And if so, how do you strengthen muscles around the feet? So there's been data published on barefoot populations around the world in uh, um, third world nations. And they seem to have a very low incidence of, of flat foot related disease. They still have bunions. You can find bunions in fossils. They're, they're not caused by shoes. They can be exacerbated by shoes. But arches and ankles seem to be pretty strong in kids who've never worn shoes. But wearing shoes is necessary, at least in Virginia Beach. It's, it's like over 100 degrees out there today, and it, and it snows in the winter occasionally here. We have four seasons. And so you have to wear shoes in Virginia Beach. But the use of shoes can lead to some atrophy. You know, it takes about 10 weeks to get a measurable benefit out of most types of strengthening exercises. Only takes about 96 hours to start to atrophy, one of life's many injustices. So it doesn't take long to, to start to slide. So one of the caveats about exercise is it, it definitely is a, it's not something you're ever going to be able to stop. I already said you have to exercise. Specific exercises to strengthen the foot and, and leg muscles are certainly available, and physical therapists can teach those. Um, and Using things like TheraBands can be helpful, but I think it needs to be very carefully addressed so as not to um, move joints beyond their uh, accepted range of motion, and it has to be consistently done. They did do a study on children where they had a bunch of children uh, sit inside at school and do exercises to try and strengthen their arch, and then their control group was they let all the other kids go outside and play at recess. And the kids that went outside and played at recess have better arches than the ones that did the exercises. So um, 
if you can, find an exercise that you like doing and that you might call playing and do that. For me, it's playing in the water. Uh, but you, you definitely need to exercise. Whether or not you can actually strengthen your arch by doing so is controversial. With the blue plate special you mentioned, uh, can one go back <laughs> to regular activity um, or should they restrict their exercise after surgery for a while? Well, for a while, yeah. For at least a few weeks, you have to take it easy because um, you you uh, have to let the bones get a grip on those bone anchors. But after just a few weeks, your, your bones do have a good grip on those bone anchors and they're probably not going anywhere. So. Um, uh, the recovery is very deliberately intended to be very short. Um, we also, uh, we can, well, I guess you're asking regular activity. What is regular activity? That's going to vary from person to person, what you consider normal or acceptable. Um, I think that people with connective tissue disease have to pick and choose what to do with their lives. I've known people who are champion martial artists and accomplished dancers and as adults, but you know they they they're going to have some bad days and they're going to have to and they're going to have more injuries than people who don't have connective tissue disease, and so I have to be pretty smart about doing those extreme things. Uh, I'd venture to say that some some wonderful athletes, like uh, probably a lot of Olympic swimmers, have abnormal collagen and hyperflexible shoulders. And they're able to do amazing things in the water, but they probably have pretty painful shoulders at some point. So I think you need to be smart about how you use your body, no matter who you are. I'll be 60 years old this year. I'm I'm not going out there and throwing a truck tire around my backyard like some, you know, P96 uh, uh, <laughs> athlete. But I still I did about 30 triathlons, and I and I still compete in surfing. So I've tried to keep keep body and soul together for a long time. But you do have to be smart about it. This person is experiencing metatarsal pain in both feet, uh, both on top and below the foot. Uh, it shoots up to the toes, and it feels like walking on glass. Why, mm. What is that? Do you have any idea of what that might be and what to do about it? It's not only impossible, but it's malpractice to try and diagnose somebody over the phone. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so what are I'm some of the common gonna... causes of that type of uh, walking on glass fair, pain? Fair enough. So um, some some potential causes of those kind of symptoms might be nerve related. So when people talk about electrical pain or sharp pain like that, I, I wonder if there's a nerve that's being damaged. Uh, a lot of people probably know somebody who's had carpal tunnel syndrome in their wrist. A lot of people with connective tissue disorders are more prone to such syndromes, nerve compression syndromes. Um, there's an ankle version of that called tarsal tunnel syndrome. So stretching the nerve behind the ankle that gives sensation to the sole of the foot could create some symptoms kind of like they're, they're being described there. Now, whether or not that's what it is, I have no idea. Um, it's also possible to get uh, stress fractures where the bones can bend and bend till they break like a piece of metal. This is more common in adult women uh, and certainly more common in people who haven't done a lot of weight-bearing exercise. Bones are a dynamic thing. Bones look like rocks, but they act like trees. If, you, if, you blow, if a wind blows on a tree all the time, it'll change shape. If a bone is chronically and repetitively stimulated, it'll get stronger unless that chronic and repetitive stimulation is too abrupt and then it can crack. And it can crack like your windshield where a little crack can turn into a big crack and have to be put back together with screws and plates and such. So, um, so yeah, these things are a little tricky. Um, but uh, I certainly think that that person who sent in the question ought to go see a doctor sooner than later. For Achilles tendon contractures, is it a good idea possibly for someone with EDS to have that released? Or Some is time. that something not recommended? Yeah, it is necessary to try and optimize ankle range of motion. If your ankle can only move a certain number of degrees and then it stops prematurely, the foot is going to have to do extra movement, which will probably hurt. 
and cause problems. So an, an adequate ankle range of motion is certainly worth pursuing. Now, it sounds crazy to recommend that someone with Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome stretch, but sometimes stretching is necessary, but it has to be very carefully approached with a knowledgeable trainer or therapist. Also, we often use splints to hold the foot in a functional position when you're watching TV or maybe, maybe if you're uh, sleeping. And there are splints designed for this purpose that are commercially available and also um, medically prescribable and usually paid for by health insurance. So a nighttime splint can be a very valuable tool for someone with a tight Achilles tendon. Surgically lengthening it is always a little sketchy. Um, there's no real good scientific way of knowing exactly how much to lengthen it. If you don't lengthen it, if, if I don't lengthen it enough, the patient might still be in the same predicament they were when they got here. Um, if I over-lengthen it, then they can uh, have a very apropulsive foot where it just doesn't work like it's supposed to. It's floppy and weak. And so uh, anytime you cut a muscle or a tendon, you're going to lose a grade of strength. Out of five grades, you're going to lose one. That's 20%. That's a significant loss of strength that's going to either need to be rebuilt or, rebuilt or maybe even lost permanently. So I try very hard to avoid cutting into the Achilles tendon or the gastrocnemius and soleus muscles in people in general, but also in people with connective tissue disorder. That having been said, if we've tried everything conservative and the ankle still isn't moving enough, we're going to make it move. It has to move or the foot will suffer a lot. Thank you so much. That is all the time we have today. Our next webinar will be next Wednesday, September 5th. Dr. Antonio Bobena will present on emotional dimensions of EDS and HSD. You can look for that sign up on social media in just a few minutes. Thank you so much, Dr. Agnew. We had a great presentation and it seemed like a lot of people have some really good feedback um, and it was very helpful. So thank you so much for being here. I enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Good night. Thank you. Have a good day, all.